So, sir, for me, it was the freedom of like understanding <laughs> faith has territory. That was that that just that just blew my mind, and it was like from Friday session to this morning session, um, speaking about financing, uh, finances, and then also speaking about wanting him more. It, it hit in a different area for me um, this time around, sir. Um, I, I think because I was seeking out a lot of different things like new car, um, uh, more property, sir, and I would just wasn't, I would just wasn't getting it. So I was trying hard, trying to put my hands to work, and just totally forgot. Oh, oh, I totally forgot about just seeking him. Oh, so it hit. It just, it was like a slap in the face. Like, oh man. And um, also when you were speaking to Tyler and the um, and the the other brothers. And you you had said, do this at home. I, oh, man. I immediately th thought about, like, the first time I came here, sir, and I went back home, literally locked myself in my in-law's closet. Well, we had our own room, but <laughs> in-law's closet. And I would, I would put on the William McDowell um, uh, album, sir, just to, like, because it was like it was the sound of the room and I was like okay I gotta pray like I was taught how to pray and I was just remembering everything I said I this was the place where I was and I got so comf ooh, I got so comfortable sir oh oh I felt nasty Jesus but um, <laughs> that yeah <laughs> But yes, yeah, sir, uh, that was, um, that was a, like a very pivotal moment for me, sir. It just felt free. It felt very airy. Um, like, yeah, it just, it felt free, very airy and all that. Like, I think you should talk to him about um, when he told you that you're getting comfortable on a thread. Okay. Just trying to trigger your mind. Yes. Oh, the background. Okay, so... Um, so, so about perspective, like, not you, you can't take his words lightly in the room and not apply it outside of the room. Right, right. So you were trying to say, well, how am I comfortable? Instead of just saying, I'm comfortable somewhere. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be saying this for no reason. Right. Instead of trying to dissect what he's saying. Right. Take it. Right. Absolutely. Then mm -hmm. let me elaborate. Yes, sir. <clears throat> what Martin just described is called hearkening to the voice of the Lord. Oh, wow. oh. Paying attention. Yeah. Yes, sir. So when God's voice meets the analysis of your mind, the heart is not humble enough at that moment to have an immediate adjustment to the reality that God is talking. That's the first reality. Yes, sir. And that's what prophetic people miss it. Yes, sir. Prophetic people jump to, what's God saying? Instead of, whoa, God is talking. Yes, sir. The reason you hearken to the voice of the Lord is the same reason you would need to answer someone um, and seek if they were calling you from a distance. If we were in a mall right now and I'm trying to get your attention, you 10 stores. Hey, Mike, Mike. What is, what is dad saying? Boy, <laughs> you ain't going to know like this. There's hundreds of people in between y'all. Yes, sir. There's too many filters. But the moment you recognize, oh, the voice of my father is calling. <laughs> That's how you hearken. Yes, yes, sir. But when that voice meet an analysis first, instead of a, a demand to be called to attention. Yes, 
<laughs> That's what Samuel did. That's what he was taught by Eli. Who's calling me? Who's calling me? Eli, did you call me? No, go lie down. That statement, before I get to the statement I'm trying to make, was a training in and of itself. Because what was he laying down? By the ark. So what's the first thing you're supposed to do when you feel like you can't discern the voice? Get back in the presence. Every time he went to Eli. Did you call me? Go back and lay down. And he trained them twice as many times in the presence as he did in the voice. That's right. The second time he came back, go back and lay down. Where? By the ark. Where's the ark? The presence of God. Then the third time, he trained them in the voice. And how did he train them in the voice? By the same, by the principle of that same scripture, hearkening to the voice of the Lord your God. What did he tell them to do? He said, next time you hear that voice, say, yes, Lord, your servant hears. (laughs) The first thing, that's right, he didn't say, ask him what he's saying. He said, tell him I'm listening. Michael, Michael. What are you trying to say, God? I don't know. Yeah, I, was, I was fasting yesterday. I was praying. My, my. Yeah. No, no, no. You're going to be interpreting dreams out of dream books for three years. <laughs> you're going to be at every prophetic conference. You're going to be asked for confirmation. You're going to be in every prophet seed line. You're going to be answering Manasseh George's phone calls. (laughs) (laughs) Michael, Michael. Oh, Lord, you calling me? Yes, I'm listening. The response, the proper response to the voice brings you close to hear what he's saying. Yes, sir. Then you can get all the details. Oh. Then you can get understanding. Yes, sir. You got to let the voice call you to attention. Yes, sir. Did they help you? Yes, sir. So that's what he's talking about. Yes, sir. When I said you're getting comfortable, you're trying to think, well, how am I getting comfortable? I don't know. I don't know. You're getting comfortable. I'm listening, Lord. I don't understand it. I don't know where. I don't know. But I know. I know God's talking to me. Does it make sense? Does it add up? No. But I know God's talking to me. And that's the only way his voice becomes clear. If his voice cannot call you to attention first, it cannot give you direction. Because you're supposed to be able to recognize his voice in the crowd. You hear your wife calling for you in the mall and she weighs 15 stories down? You're going to recognize that voice. And see, God, his voice is already pre-programmed. That you recognize it. Uh It may be in a distant. Mm -hmm. It may be faint. Which is why he said to hearken. The moment you pay attention, the moment it'll be clear. Mm -hmm. No matter how how loud that mall is, how many people are in it. Mm -hmm. Let your wife call out. Oh. You're going to her. You're going to her direction. You're calling to her attention. It should be the same way with God. Because some people use, let me tell you, here's a rebellious heart. They use mm, the lack of knowledge around what God is saying as an excuse to not be called to attention. I didn't, they they play dumb. Like Mason, he'll go in a room somewhere and I'm like, hey Mason, you do it. And he act like he can't. Like, boy, you got ears. You heard me calling. If you think I'm trying to talk to you, then you come to attention. Not playing dumb because you want to finish what you're doing and then you want to come up, oh, were you talking to me? That's crazy, isn't it? Yes, sir. They don't want to be called to attention. The rebellious do not want to be called to attention. And they're always using it as an excuse. 
Well, I don't know what the Lord want me to do. I don't know what God's going to do. Respond to his voice. It's funny the other day you're saying Marla's not making it through the gate. So I was like, I'm making it through the gate this time now, Dad. <laughs> you got to reinforce this truth just to add it along. When he talks, like, hey, you got to remember no words that he speaks fall to the ground. Whether you understand it, whether you see it clearly or not, you got to think like that. Whatever he says, don't try to dissect it. How it's going to happen? It's not happening. It's not working. No, it's working. No time You're the one that doesn't believe. Yeah, don't be like, well, I don't know what you're trying to say. I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. <laughs> don't play dumb. <laughs> Just be called to attention. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The voice first job is to call you to attention. Not to give you direction, not to give you confirmation, not to show you the future, not to tell you the secrets. But when he talks, he wants to see if you have it in you. I'm listening, Lord. I heard you. Yes, Lord, I'm listening. That's what sets you up for what, he, for what he wants to say. That's what sets you up for what he wants to say. Can his voice call you to attention? And if you ignore that voice of conviction, if you ignore that voice, because basically I got so used to it, there were times he really didn't hear me. And the Bible talks about a seared conscience. The word seared means to literally become insensitive. You're, it's no longer sensitive to the presence of God. Yes, sir. It's numbed in the things of God. Like that pastor's wife that came and sat on my couch. Oh. And she said, I don't feel nothing. Yeah, because your constant just seared. I wonder how many holy things you took lightly. Because every time the holy things came around you and you didn't reverence it, your conscience was losing sensitivity towards the things of God. And what happens is that distances you and it distances you to the point where he says, Michael. Yes, sir. It becomes. Yes, sir. Not because he's not talking, because you didn't come to attention when he was. That's the first thing. So stop hyperventilating. What is God trying to tell me? I just want to hear God come to attention. Be at ease. I like that. I'm calling you to attention. Wait before him in prayer. Find yourself before him in, in the presence. Be called to attention. Here I am. That's what he said. That's what Samuel said. Here I am. So even the third part of the training concerning how to be called to attention was about the presence. Wow. How do you let the voice of God call you to attention. You find yourself aware that you're in the presence of God. Here I am. Your servant here. He said, here I am. He had been laying by the ark the whole time, but didn't know where he was. That's what happens when that heart becomes insensitive. Yes. He was laying by the ark. That thing put hemorrhoids in the, in the giants. It stripped enemy armies of their weaponry. It's, it was so tangibly present. And he didn't know it. Because every time... Every time the Lord stood by Samuel... He left the Lord to go to Eli because he did not know he was in the presence of God. Isn't that strong? Yes, yes sir. In Samuel 3 and 18, 1 Samuel 3 and 18, I believe, is the verse 18. Look it up. I'm talking about it. It says, and the Lord came and stood by Samuel as he did the other times. Listen, the Bible says, like I'm sitting right here with you. 
that Jesus came to Samuel. He says, Samuel. Samuel. It's 3 and 17? 3 and 7. First time you're 3 and 10. <laughs> That's like me saying, Samuel. Samuel. This is what the Lord did. First time you're 3 and 10. The Bible says Jesus came and said, Samuel, he stood by him. He did not call him from Eli's room. He said, Samuel. And every time he said, Samuel, Samuel got up and went over there looking for his voice. My look at you say, Carlos, and you know, uh, you look at that drink and say, hey, what, you call me? <laughs> like, you, what kind of hearing test you need? <laughs> This wasn't some voice from heaven. This was a voice of visitation. This was a voice of proximity. Daniel chapter 4, the voice fell from heaven. Like thunder, you don't know where it's coming from. Boom. You don't know where it is. The voice fell from heaven with Nebuchadnezzar. That's what the Bible says. But Jeremiah says, the word of the Lord came to him. That wasn't proximity. That was volume. <laughs> for Jeremiah, it was volume. For Nebuchadnezzar, it was atmosphere. But for Samuel, it was proximity. And when he heard Jesus, he heard him in the ear on the side that Jesus was standing on. And he looked the other way. What? Because the lack of the awareness of the presence of God made him dumb and deaf to the voice of God. Deaf and dumb spirit. Okay, every time I call your name, why don't you look over there and, and answer your quiz? Mason. <laughs> he was waiting on that. <laughs> Mason. You see, how the, you see how dumb that looks? Yes, sir. That's the prophets of 2024. Oh, Mason. Bro. Stop. <laughs> you know why? Because they're not retreating to the presence of God. They're retreating to the gifts of the spirit, the word of knowledge, the word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy, and some of them the third eye. Yes, sir. Mason. That's how dumb it looks. That's, messed up. That's how dumb it looks trying to hear the voice of God and know the voice of God and you keep avoiding the presence of God. Yes, you look stupid. Yes, sir. You look like a fool. Yes, and you impersonate the voice of the one that you, you, you intend to ignore. Oh, foolish Galatians. Who have bewitched you? You know what that means? Can I translate that? Oh, oh stupid church. <laughs> Who tricked you? What witchcraft are you working? Oh, stupid church. What witchcraft are you working? That's Bible. Yes, it is. Amen. It's stupid to tamper with the things of the presence and muddy them with mixture. In the prophetic. Very dumb. Very dumb. Very dumb. That's a deaf and dumb spirit. So even when he went back to him, he said, okay, here I am. Tell him here I am. Find yourself in the presence of God. And more importantly, develop an awareness of your proximity to the presence of God. That's a whole other sermon. Because I teach you all the time, the presence, you know, the presence doesn't come or go. You just become more aware. That's the manifest presence of God. It's not a stronger measure of the presence. It's not quantity. It's the quality of the reality that you've learned how to become aware of the presence of God. That's always there. So you respond differently. Yes, sir. 
And if you're not careful, you're not careful, preachers, prophets. You'll be trying to prove that God is in proximity with people who don't even want the presence mm -hmm. and whose conscience has become seared to the sensitivity of God. Ooh. When that pastor's wife said that, huh? the average preacher, well, let me just, let me, let me just prove to you. This. Mm -hmm. That's what they do now. They push people in the floor. Yes. They lay hands on them rough. They try to trigger these fake praise breaks. Hi. They're trying to get a people whose heart is seared and insensitive to the presence of God to respond to the presence. She would have thought that was a reflection on me and that was a reflection on her. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's a pastor wife. I ain't gonna say who it was. They know, let them be convicted. Amen. It don't even matter. I've, I've entertained a lot of pastors and pastors' wives. With the pastor, of course. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> She's right to clear something. <laughs> Make it play. <laughs> Let me give it a Greek definition of this. <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Yes, sir. So we're doing something now. We're training the prophet. You've seen videos. Put some of the videos up. Let's show some of the videos. And um, you've seen videos of people operating the prophetic. And I'm doing a pop-up group for people who want to uh, really know God. That's really what it's about. The prophetic is just the overflow of knowing God. Amen. It says he reveals his secrets to those that fear him. And his friends and his servants. You get what I'm saying? So it's not about trying to be prophetic. It's really about trying to be close to him. And the prophetic is the overflow of that proximity, of closeness. So we're, if you want to know how to get connected, and you've seen some things with people moving in the prophetic and very accurately in the prophetic, things that no one could have known but God and God shared it with them. And you really want a vibrant relationship. The, pro the prophetic is really. Um, the display of how vibrant your relationship is with God. Wow. And you want that. You're seeking for something more. Huh? Yeah. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Thank you, Holy Ghost. Now, I've, read, I've written some best-selling books on the prophetic years, more than a decade ago. And they're still best-selling books. Um, so I've taught the prophetic for years. And I walked in that office for 10 years before the Lord... Uh, commissioned me in the apostolic. I was called to the apostolic 23 years ago at the beginning of my calling. But the Lord trained me in the prophetic and I stood in that office before he commissioned me. Um, and it was as I was serving as a prophet that the Lord taught me some more things about the apostolic and I serve um, the apostolic as well. And then he finally commissioned me in that it wasn't until, what, 20, 2018 and I publicly. Yes, sir. Now, what's crazy about it, when he was training me in it, I actually wrote a book about it oh, yes, in sir. 2015. Oh, but I did not. It's called Apostles 101. Listen, you're not going to find a lot of stuff about it. I mean, just moving on. It's very heavy. If you want to understand the, the weight and the authority of an apostle, and it's, which is very important because if a person says an apostle, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to feel that force. Yes, sir behind them. You're supposed to feel that force with them. I mean, Star Wars level. I mean, I'm talking about Jedi. If you can't feel that force, they lying. That's what Jesus said in the book of Revelations. I know you and I like the way that you have examined those who say they are apostles and you found them to be liars because they're not apostles. This is Jesus. Red letters. This is Jesus, like celebrating the sheep for exposing the false apostles. So this should be, this, 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 this should be the average aptitude of a believer to understand how weighty the apostolic is supposed to be. How can you read the book of Acts and not understand how weighty the apostolic is supposed to be? You can't get too many chapters into it. It don't take a thesaurus and a, a Greek definition. That, that apostolic nature just jump off the scriptures. 
and you can be less than the authority of a deacon and you're supposed to be able to discern the weight of the apostolic in someone who says they are an apostle so and i started um i wrote a book about it because the lord started using me in it at different times and different seasons and i knew i was moving as an apostle but i did not disclose that publicly because the weight of what was happening was more than prophetic and then i wrote the book and you know that became and then i didn't publicly embrace it where the lord commissioned me to until 2018 and then also that's important to this tra this whole training piece because the apostolic mm -hmm. governs the prophetic the apostolic exists par partially to govern prophetic expression and that's what paul is doing in first corinthians 14. he said that when he set guidelines for spiritual assessments of what people call prophetic we're not just supposed to accept anything as prophetic. A lot of this stuff is kind of wacky. It ain't kind of wacky. It's crazy. It's just crazy. It's just, I mean, off the rockers. You get what I'm saying? But the Bible says, he who is spiritual, let him judge. Let him examine. Let him assess it. So the apostolic surveillance is those things and make sure that what people say is true prophetic expression is being vetted. Yes, sir. To validate it or invalidate it. Yes, so uh, that's why it's important. So as an apostle, I am training in the prophetic again. And I started doing this prim uh, primarily in um, 2012, like on an official level. My first school of the prophets was in 2012. So there's a lot of info. There's a lot of stuff that's out there. There's something I had at one point I had available in Chariz Charisma magazine that was newer maybe something it's something i created in 2023 yes sir it's called 10 minutes of 10 years of prophetic education in 10 minutes yes sir and we go through definition my definition the whole um complete world view of the prophetic you want to have a complete overview and world view of the prophetic and then you can hone into certain details because some people that they're word knowledge heavy or they're prophecy heavy or they're gift heavy and some people, they're actually office heavy. Mm -hmm. They believe in the yes, office of the prophet, the mantle of the prophet, but their gifts weak. You get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So we want to do the full, just the full measure of the prophetic. And it takes the apostolic for that because the apostolic governs that. And the apostolic can vet that and the apostolic can correct that. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. There are prophetic voices right now. And I, wouldn't, I won't mention their names with God as an apostle had me speak that the voices would be silenced. And they have been. Now, a lot of people would probably feel like that about me. And I don't understand. My voice hasn't been silenced. My voice has been directed. <laughs> and I'm reaching more people. I had a Forbes article that reached 332 million. That's 9 million shy of the entire United States. So my one Forbes article reached more people than follow Beyonce on Instagram. You know why? Because God told me, take my attention off of church people who are not willing and ready to be disciples. And focus on people who really want to go through the process and get something strong in him. And in doing that, you see people in the videos. And we've had nine resurrections from the dead, and I've only participated in two of them. That means seven other people around me have been trained to raise the dead. That's some powerful stuff. Every miracle you can think of from autism, every deliverance you can think of, all the way up to transgenders. That's powerful. That's real powerful. And the Lord had me come off that so I'm not wasting the oil to try to prove to Christians that I'm anointed. And then he used that to expand my voice. But on the other hand, there are ministries that, you know, they lose their voice. And when a ministry is not credible, that's part of apostolic right and apostolic authority. It's to silence. Paul, uh, the apostle, when he was talking about two uh, particular people who were in leadership and they had gotten beside themselves. And uh, he said, their voices must be stopped. And see, a real apostle doesn't abuse that authority. And see, when God is for you, it doesn't matter if people want your voice to shut up. Oh, God, help us. 
And same thing like Kenneth Hagin and William Branham. When William Branham got beside himself and he started telling people he was Elijah, then God spoke to Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Hagin actually prophesied that William Branham was going to lose his life. Wow. Not because he was trying to kill him. He didn't want the man dead. So most prophets today don't even qualify for that kind of revelation because they want people's detriment. All their prophecies are laced with who's going to fall and who's going to have a scandal. Mm -hmm. You want Sorry. their detriment. So you don't qualify for that right or that authority. It's illegitimate, that authority. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So is the word. It's false. It's false prophecy. Yes, sir. And do you get what I'm saying? Yes, sir. But see, Kenneth Hagin had a real vision. And it was detailed. And he saw that William Brandon was going to die in a horrific uh, car accident to destroy his body to save his soul like Paul talks about mm -hmm. in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Mm -hmm. wow. And that man went up out of here in the car accident, one of the most accurate prophets in history, William Branham. And even though he went crazy, they still talk about him in God's generals because the man's ministry was phenomenal. It's one of the most phenomenal things you would ever see. He didn't miss except for him. That's the danger of coming out of the presence of God. Yes. Your gift would be accurate for everybody else except you. Oh, wow. He did not miss when it came to prophecy, but missed it because he, some kind of way, some familiar lying spirit told him he was Elijah. And God had to take him up out the earth because he was too influential. Now, God don't take people out the earth because they get it wrong or they get it messed up. But this man was too influential. The whole Baptist convention was, uh, had a meeting set up because they didn't believe in prophecy. And that man went in that meeting and he told them everything they were thinking, the conversations that they had before they got in there and what was going to happen. And it shocked them. This man had too much influence. So people who don't know the voice of God are used to hearing the voice of God through him. So if, they, if he goes south and he says he's Elijah, they believe He's Elijah. Because yes, he didn't miss. So it was the influence, not the man. It was the influence that God was wiping out. Yes, sir. And the influence of him got so great, he had to go with it. And to this day, people still visit his grave because they still think he's Elijah. And they think one day he's going to rise from the dead. He is going to rise from the dead. But with everybody else. <laughs> not by himself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what the apostolic is for it keeps all the crazy stuff out of it keeps all the mixture out of prophetic Amen. so if you want to make sure you're appearing in this thing then you want to really I know people are abusing training now everyone got some kind of online, online class <laughs> so you just got to use discernment and you got to like I was talking about you got to hearken to the voice if you feel like God talking to you you can hit it or miss it you have to know God's talking to you, and I hope you join. The information is there where you can join. I'm doing a free pop-up group and a private, exclusive uh, group in Facebook. So if you want that kind of training, all you got to do is go to the link. Uh, or I think does the, does the thing work on, if they come in a word on YouTube, does it work? No, sir. Okay, it doesn't work there. But um, there's a link there. There's a link there where you can get the information. And uh, you can sign up for that pop-up group because I'm going to be teaching. I've been doing this for a long time. I did it with my eyes closed. I've trained a lot of people in the prophetic. Can I just say one more thing there before? Mm -hmm. So that's important because uh, what he's saying, he's actually teaching you to learn the preferences, how God talks. Because when you lose that awareness that I he's guess. talking, you're going to lose that conviction. And the voice of conviction is not often. It's not, um, he doesn't have to raise his voice. But he was giving the example like, Michael, Michael, Michael. He doesn't have to raise his voice for you to hear him. Yes. That was it. Just learn the preferences. Stop doing That's the main thing that sets us back. We still want to do something in our own way, our own edit. It doesn't take away from you, it's making you better.